Welcome, everyone. Good seeing you. Uh, thank you so much for uh, showing up for uh, a masterclass on B2B sales. And Aaron McReynolds is truly an expert. He sent a, spent about a decade really driving sales and leading sales management in great companies like Okta and Qualtrics and Laceworks and now Alisio. And I'll let him tell you about Alisio. But we backed Alisio because we love the team and we believe that um, the moment is now to apply new technologies to really improving go-to-market and up-leveling people for new kind of performance management, uh, whether that's coaching um, and really just help people level up. And um, Aaron, I remember too, talking about in sales, you can have a great day in sales. And in a sense, the goal is, how do you have more great days in sales? So um, before we be begin on this really um, actionable uh, masterclass, Aaron, can you introduce Alessio? Yeah, happy to. Yeah. Thanks, everyone, for jumping on. Uh, it's kind of nice because I think I've met a lot of you, which is great. Um, so, yeah, I was 10 years in, in B2B SaaS sales, actually started my career at Goldman Sachs doing institutional sales for them. Um, but knew I wanted to get into tech, join Qualtrics. Uh, they shipped me out to Australia. So I started my career in Sydney. Um, and it was funny. We had you know, probably eight to 10 different tools at Qualtrics and about 800 salespeople at the time. Um, and we defaulted to a spreadsheet to answer that question. In. Like, how do you know you've had a great day in sales? How do you know you're going to have a predictable great day tomorrow and beyond? Um, and so we defaulted to a spreadsheet and we use that spreadsheet to track uh, a 10 point framework where every day the commercial AE team would come in and get 10 points every day. And those points were made up of your basic KPIs, things you would track in Salesforce, cold calls all the way down to revenue generation, the entire funnel. Um, we were pretty strict. We weren't allowed to leave till we got our 10 points every day. Um, but also we're given that autonomy of when you get your 10 points, you could leave. So if you really wanted to go and have a four o'clock tea time on the golf course, go be productive in the morning. And that was kind of that reward. So I used it for about two years of poultry. Uh, all the teams that had adopted that spreadsheet were the ones that were hitting quota, going to presence club. Um, and then I left and I joined Okta right when COVID hit. And the minute COVID hit, as, as many of us remember, we went fully remote. And it was the first time in my career that I'd been fully remote. And instantly it was kind of that panic and anxiety of like, okay, I'm a new rep here at Okta. I know I have to prove myself. And so I called my manager. I was like, who's the top performer? What do they do? He's like, I'm not sure. It's in Tableau and we don't have access to Tableau. Uh, and so from day one, I just felt like I was kind of on an island. So started using that spreadsheet again and did that for my entire sales career and got to that point of saying, okay, if we can't answer this question, how do you know you've had a great day in sales at Qualtrics, at Okta, at Lacework? Um, then obviously other sales managers are going to have that same problem. So did a ton of research, you know, called a number of sales leaders here in Utah and in California and just felt like it was the moment to go and build this product. So today, um, you know, we're a performance management platform for go-to-market teams. That's from sales reps to account management to CS, et cetera. Um, every single user on the platform is benchmarked on those 10 points a day. Um, and then we have gamified the process with leaderboards, competitions, real-time rewards and recognition. And then the other piece that I'd done in a Google Doc and the spreadsheet was all my one-on-ones, pipe reviews, et cetera. And so those are all tracked and archived within the platform as well. So that's V1, that's live. We're about 30 customers on that version. And then right now we're in beta with our AI application, which is essentially the ability to deliver all of the insights uh, to the managers so they can identify areas of strength or weakness with their reps and then go in and train them. Um, and then essentially every rep of that organization knows what the top performers are doing. So a little overview, but happy to answer any questions at the end. Yeah, that's great. Wonderful. Okay, so let's get into um, your story of your very first sales at Elysio. Mm -hmm. So many people on the call are thinking about their first uh first partner, first design partner, whatever. So share your story and let's get in some, some tips there. No, but for, yeah, and I'll clarify, we sell primarily to B2B SaaS sales teams. Uh, we do have real estate customers, financial services customers, but primarily B2B SaaS. So that's the angle I'm going to take for this kind of entire discussion. I think it applies outside of that. Um, but when we started, you know, we had a Figma file when we kind of first did our raise. Um, and it was essentially saying, okay, if we built this, 
would you pay for it? Um, and I think that's a really important first step. Um, and so when, what we did with that Figma file was go to these sales leaders, show them the concept of the 10 point framework and say, does this apply? Do you know how to answer a great day in sales? And so obviously at the beginning, you want to go to your network, right? Like find that circle of people that you can call, text, get in a room with, instantly um instead of trying to do cold outbound and etc we did the cold outbound to test kind of like a hypothesis on what we were building um but for those first sales it was calling old sales leaders that i've worked with uh referrals from them and that's how we essentially got our first five uh, i think all five kind of essentially had some form of a tie to qualtrics or octa um, and that's what we kind of always recommend we've done this for a number of startups it's Go to that middle of your circle and then ask for the referrals. And it's it's called the swarm approach. So you start in the middle of the hive and then you go out and you go out and out. And so, you know, I think we're fortunate, you know, we were backed by VCs. And so the ability to go and say, okay, we've identified this company in your portfolio. We think it would resonate. Can we get an introduction? So that, that's how we went out and got our first one. Okay. And then how did you... You're an early stage startup. You've got a Figma file. Maybe that's not apparent to them. How did you um, get credibility and um, talk about onboarding them? Yeah, yeah. I think we were really fortunate. One of our essentially design partners, and I always refer to them as that Michael Jordan, right? So we'll give you the shoes for free. And then I know the kids are going to go out and buy them. Uh, and we got fortunate enough that one of those design partners was MongoDB. Um, and so instantly from pretty much month one, we onboarded uh, two sales teams at MongoDB. Everything was manual in nature. Uh, we essentially just replaced the spreadsheet for them. And then what was phenomenal was that those two teams organically grew to eight at MongoDB. We didn't sell those additional teams. It was, hey, I've heard this buzz around the water cooler about XYZ team on Elysio. Can we get on as well? And then before we knew it, we were in Israel and we were in Australia with MongoDB. Okay. And then did you charge them for the product at that time? No, no we okay. did not. We said, okay, you guys can have this free. We want feedback. Um, and, you know, I think a crucial part of that is within kind of two, three days of being on the platform, they were giving us feature suggestions uh, of which are still in the platform today. And so that was kind of our give and take. It's like, we'll give you this for free, but we want the feedback. And so they wanted a donut chart breakout of where their reps were spending their time in a day. And we built it and shipped it in 48 hours for them. And so I just think initially from day one, they're like, okay, they're here for us. This is a partnership, um, but we gave it to them for free. Okay. And I think I heard in there that you had gone to the head of the sales team. Um, and so you had a champion and were you thinking about, I got to get the champion and I got to get a buy-in from some of the users or tell us what was activation? Like, were you tracking their usage so you can make sure they're adhering? Yeah. Yeah. I think one of the really important pieces is we downloaded a tool like very, very beginning called user pilot. Um, and for us, user pilot allows us to see daily active users when they last logged into the platform. And so we were like hawks. We monitored that every hour of every day, who's not logging in. And we would send emails to those users and say, Hey, you know, haven't seen the adoption yet. What can we do to help? Um, and so we just kind of gave that white glove service at the beginning of the day, but we were fortunate that yes, the person that we, got initially was the RVP of sales. Um, they just championed it from day one. But I think, you know, the approach and, and kind of the organic success was he adopted it for the teams that he managed, but he wasn't essentially selling it to anyone else. It was they heard about the product um, and then everything was essentially organic inbound to us to go add those additional teams. Looking back on it, you know, we probably could have even pushed him harder to go make additional introductions, et cetera. But with having that organic success, we just wanted to kind of let that flow and see if that was even a possibility for us going forward to land and expand organically or how much kind of handholding would we have to do to get within the rest of the organization? Yeah, it's almost like that's a key metric. So did you establish some target metrics even at the early days to let you know, is it working or, you know? Yeah, yeah, that, that's one of the things, you know, we we do from day one. It's, hey, give us, give us a report of your performance last month and let's see how you guys are trending after one month on the platform. So we do that with every single customer that we have. Uh, we're able to now tout a 32% increase in productivity with the platform. 
And then we just ran a PLC with Scorpion and they saw a 96% increase in productivity. Awesome. On their metrics, which I love about that. There's a lot of software companies today that are talking about their own metrics. They're like, well, people, you know, 40% of people are logging in every day. And at the end of the day, that's important for the company that provides the software, but you're really driving the business metrics of your customer. Yeah. So what, what was kind of fascinating is, you know, we had built essentially templates out of the box where if you don't know what a great day looks like, or you don't know which KPIs to track for your sales team, out of the box, we have those. And now we're fortunate enough that we've collected over a million KPIs in the platform and it's data-driven. But before that, we were just kind of winging it saying, hey, I've, I've been in sales for 10 years. This is what I used to track. This is what MongoDB is tracking. And so they allowed us day one to have a template that says MongoDB framework. Yeah. And so any user of the platform that didn't know what they were doing, we were able to say, hey, if you don't know, we can kind of help you and coach you through which metrics are important. And if you don't trust us, here's the third best sales team in North America is MongoDB's metrics. Wow. Okay. And Christina uh, asked a question and everybody should feel free to put their questions in. Um, tell us about, did the other teams at MongoDB start paying or what overall, what was your path to start charging customers? Yeah, so we, we we haven't ever charged MongoDB. Like for us, it's such a valuable narrative and story and has opened so many doors. Um, that leader actually has left. Um, and so now we're in a position where we say, okay, any additional sales teams, we are going to charge you going forward. And so now we're kind of on the front foot to go and sell deeper into MongoDB. Um, you know, I think we just made that decision early on for how good of a partner they were. It's like, no, no, yeah. you guys keep serving us. You guys can have it for free. Um, and then we actually had a referral link from that sales manager where anyone that goes to his website and they want to understand what he does for a good day, it actually links directly to the requested demo on Elysium. So wow. it's just, it's kind of, you know, it's gone beyond just giving them a free product now. Yeah, no, that's really smart. And it is interesting. There's two things that we hear a lot in early stage B2B sales. So one is that generally startups underprice Mm -hmm. um, meaning there's like a little bashful and in one sense that if you're really delivering value, you should be able to charge something, right? And sometimes people are underpricing. But the other thing that is also true is that the pricing you give your initial customers, including free, mm -hmm. does not need to set any kind of precedent because if anyone asks, you can say, no, that was a charter customer. Or that was that back then we didn't have X, Y, and Z, um, so getting to paying seems uh, very important as you sales. Um, um, it, but how do you think about initial pricing now for a new customer? Yeah, yeah. So we essentially did our research based on other tools that were in market and where we kind of felt our value was against those. So if you take a CRM like Salesforce, um, every single sales team, you know, it's like 90 odd percent are either Salesforce or HubSpot. We understood what they were charging. Then we kind of looked at competition and said, okay, what are our competitors charging? And then we made a decision early on where we say, okay, we don't want to be a point solution like a lot of the competitors who just do gamification, et cetera. And so we just said, let's kind of wedge between the premier, which was Salesforce and those endpoint solutions and somewhere in the middle. Uh, we actually started at around $30 a user, never had any pushback on that pricing. And everyone was like, oh, this is cheap. So we actually jumped to 49, uh, almost overnight, went to 49 and that's where we stayed. Um, and we still are kind of getting that same response. So we we're exploring going to $77. Um, now again, We've added products, we've added functionality. You can't just do it just because you want to, like there has to be the value there. Um, but essentially for us, we're like, until that day where someone says $77 is crazy, right? And, and even then I think we can justify it. That's always gonna happen in sales. Um, I think we're just gonna continue to kind of increase that pricing. Yeah, and some, I don't know, is your, part of your fight philosophy too is now we have a rate card and then we can, you, your special potentially discount if you want it or have a trial, uh, but you don't have, just to be clear, you don't have any free trials or anything at this point. Uh, so we do for single oh. users, we have free trials. Oh, okay, so it. they okay. can sign up as a single user, come into the platform. For us, that's a lead gen source, know which yep. companies are trying to solve that problem. And then we'll outbound into those organizations. Okay. And then Nate has a question about how much of your early feedback did you get from managers versus um, the salespeople directly and how do you prioritize some of those? Yeah, really good question. In fact, that's probably one of the bigger mistakes that we made at the beginning 
is I'd been a rep and I'd been a manager and it was kind of my philosophy from day one of like, I want to build this tool for the reps. Like most people build sales tools for rev ops and then they're never the end user, right? And so you have things like Tableau where it's like, I want access, but it's so expensive. I can't get it in. It's too complicated for a rep to use. So what do we do? We default to a spreadsheet. So initially, you know, we, we gathered a lot of the feedback from the reps. Then we said, okay, actually, who do we sell to? We sell to the CROs and the VP of sales. And so then kind of from that point on, most of the feedback that we've been getting is from those leaders. Like what keeps you up at night? What's the biggest pain point that you're trying to solve for every day? And so we did, we pivoted in that research function to say, let's now go talk to the end buyer. But we still talk to the reps um, almost on like a weekly cadence at our current customers because they're the ones that are in the tool. They're the ones that are touching it every day. And we want to make that experience good for them so that if the managers are like, oh, I'm going to go and rip this out, they're like, I'll pay for it with my own credit card, right? So that's kind of the level of adoption and belief in the platform that we wanted from the end user. But when we try and sell, it's to the CRO. And so that's where we get our feedback as well. Yeah, it's really interesting. I mean, the great thing about sales is there is alignment. Like in compliance, people really don't, like big brother because the only benefit is you're going to get in trouble the goal here is everyone is aligned that if individuals perform and teams perform the come you know that everybody wins so hopefully yeah. um that is good so um uh let's ask about uh, jordan's question and i'm not bringing people up just because in the interest of time we'll just rapid fire these um you get customers asking for features how do you mm -hmm. prioritize them yeah uh, we made a very deliberate decision from the early days of like, we know what our roadmap is. If we believe that any feature requests fit into that roadmap, we will build them. So for example, that MongoDB feature request, I'm like, we should have had this anyway. Let's go build it. And we did it in 48 hours. Um, the other ones, it's like, oh, we need an integration with ABC platform. And we're like, okay, well, we're never going to go resell that integration ever again. And so we actually just kind of drew a hard and fast line and said, no, like we, we can't, like, even to the point of like, they're like, oh, well, we'll pay for the integration. And we're like, yeah, but that's so much kind of effort and dev resources that we don't have the luxury of right now. And so we turned away a customer based on that. And so that's the way we think about it. It's like we had a Salesforce integration first. That's where our customers were. And then someone come in and said HubSpot. We're like, okay, we're going to have a lot of HubSpot users. We built that integration. Someone asked for Slack. We know we're going to use that. We built that integration. Um, but beyond that, like, I have a very, very good friend. He was a sales leader at Qualtrics for a long time. Had a similar product. And he got swamped because he was trying to build his entire product roadmap based on one customer and their request. And it was a really big enterprise customer. Great paycheck. But they lost 70 customers because they were focused on that one and they no longer have a product, they're done. So that was kind of a good learning lesson for us to say, no, we can be comfortable turning away feature requests if it's not something that we think is going to be adopted and used or something we can sell down the road. Yeah, that's awesome. Okay, so let's move um, to hiring because we want to make sure that we get we cover hiring and then just looking ahead, um, top of the funnel and tech stack for sales. So let's go to hiring and... Um, um, Founder-led sales, obviously you were in sales before, but what was your first hire besides founders in the sales process? Yeah, we, we were a little unconventional uh, and probably goes against the grain. We actually hired a marketer. Um, and the reason we did that is like our philosophy has always been like we wanted to get the brand out there, build that awareness like really quickly. Um, it has served us so well. <laughs> and I know it's not probably usually the recommendation to go, but, you know, get a, a marketer first. But I think, you know, myself and my co-founder were so comfortable in the fact that we knew we could sell. It was like, okay, we either go get an SDR to feed us or let's go build this marketing engine where it still feeds us. Plus, we get the brand awareness and the story out there, et cetera. And so that's the route we went. Uh, I have absolutely no regrets doing that at all. Um, we we went all in on it. So we actually had, you know, we started a podcast. We've had over 45 guests on the podcast. We run a great day in sales event that we've taken on the road. Uh, we've been fortunate enough that we have partners that pay for all of those events. Um, but, you know, we have people inbound thinking that our team is over 100 people and we're eight. Right. And I think that's all part of that marketing strategy is like we seem bigger than we are. We seem, you know, we've been able to kind of build a lot of clout really early that I don't think we would have got if we had the SDR doing it. 
Um, but that lead function has been really strong for us. And then kind of when we had, you know, 25 odd customers, that's when we added our first full cycle AE. Uh, and I think it's a really important uh, delineation between a full cycle AE uh, and just an AE. Our, our AEs are outbounding. They're making dials. They are sending the emails, et cetera. So it was almost a two for one. Um, and I think we couldn't have done that three years ago, right? Like, it was just too easy to sell. You know, everyone was hiring SDRs left and right. And, and things have shifted so much now that the AEs are willing to say, hey, I'll, I'll do my own outbounding. I will do that because I want the job. Uh, so we actually posted that AE job listing on LinkedIn and had 55 applications in the first day. Um, okay. Lots to unpack there because I want, want to get really into the SDR a a AE and the two flavors of AE. But just to go back to marketing. So you made the decision of marketing. And was that to support your outbound or to drive inbound or both? Yeah, both. Um, so the strategy with the podcast was let's go get CROs and VP of sales on the podcast, which is a really nice warm in. And then at the end, it's like, and what do you guys do again? Right. And and we we booked three customers from the podcast already. Um, and so those were kind of individuals that you could outbound call a hundred times and never get them on the phone, but go stroke the ego. Like you want to come on a podcast and talk about yourself and sales. Everyone says yes. Um, and so I think, you know, it's, it's both an outbound motion and an inbound motion. And then from that, our market has built, you know, funnels on the website to drive people in. Uh, the podcast is driving people in. We have a newsletter with over 200 subscribers that's driving people in um and again i know it's a risk i know it's probably not the conventional way to do it but it's it's worked for us well and maybe anything is conventional if you measure it because you're measuring you have the marketing right. person you have the podcast whatever and you're seeing are they converting into customers right yeah and i think that's a really important piece so we actually attach compensation to our marketer where if you go get 50 inbound qualified leads a month there's an incentive um, and so he's not just kind of like the fluff side of marketing. He essentially feels like an SDR for us, even though he's under the title of, of marketing. That is, yeah, that's fascinating. Okay. And then maybe we'll ask you afterwards if we share the job rack for the marketer, because that, yeah. that would be interesting. Okay. And now let's go back to, um, can you just say, uh, explain a little bit in your mind, SDR, AE, and the, the, the a, AE that you ended up hiring? Yeah. yeah, so there, there are kind of two acronyms for it, it's SDR and BDR. So sales development rep, business development rep, those are kind of one to three years of experience in sales. Uh, their primary function is outbound calls, outbound emails, LinkedIn messaging to drive meetings for the AEs. Um, the AEs now, and, and again, our full cycle AE is also doing outbound motion, you know, less of a, a cadence to it um, because they're also doing the demos. They're trying to close business as well. So we've essentially gone in and said every day, break out your day, have a lot of time for the outbound, have a lot of time for your demonstrations. Um, and so that's where we kind of have fit our AEs. And then what I did for kind of the last five years of my career was uh, commercial slash enterprise AE. And that was for me, I had support. So I had a $1.5 million number that I had to go and hit every year. And I had four horsemen around me is what they called it. So I had a dedicated SE solutions engineer who did all my demos. I had a dedicated SDR just for me who did all my outbound. I had a channel partnerships person and a dedicated marketer. Um, and so it just depends kind of what stage you're at, where you're selling to, but that's kind of the three breakouts that you'll see. Okay. And now you're the founder, CEO, doing a lot of things. When do you engage with customers in yeah, sales? All, <laughs> all <day. laughs> so I've given myself a number, so I still have a quota for myself. Um, I, I have done the same thing on my calendar. I have two blocks in my day just for outbounding. So that's me being a sales rep and just making those calls, sending the emails. And then I'm probably on four to five demos a day. Um, so we actually set it with our ease where it's like, you can only pull me in and use my time once you get to a certain stage. So I need you to be able to do the initial discovery. I need you to qualify it. I need you to be comfortable enough to do the demo. And then we always try and match titles. So if they're bringing a CRO in on their side or a CEO, of course, I'll come in. Um, but obviously, like my time is valuable. And so I, I kind of essentially have them qualify it to a certain stage. But I'm also doing my own demos. Okay, so let's talk a little bit more about hiring, and then the um, 
onboarding and success metrics. And I think a mutual friend of ours um, talks about always hire two people on sales teams because they're kind of, but how, do, how should we think about um, really the nitty gritty of hiring? Yeah, I, I agree. So um, Derek, that we're talking about, I think we come from the same institution. It's the Sam Blonde philosophy. It's a Jason Lemkin philosophy. Always hire two AEs at the beginning. Uh, not to like pit them against each other, but if you hire one, and things don't work out, you don't know if it's the sales rep problem or a product problem. If you hire two and they're having the same problems, now you can identify where, where the barrier is. Uh, so we did, we hired two within a month. Um, we kind of leveled them at the same position, right? So we could essentially A-B test them on skill sets. Uh, fortunately enough, they're both doing well, which is good for us. Um, but again, we define those metrics, right? A ramping quota, we know it's hard to sell. We went in and said 20% commission for anything you sell. And sales standard is normally about 10. Um, but we really wanted to incentivize them to just kind of go from, from day one. Um, but that kind of two-person hiring, you know, I, I'll, I'll die on that sword because that's the only way that we know where the success is really coming from. Um, and then that ramping element, I think, is the one piece that a lot of people don't get right unless they've had a career in sales. So like people think they can hire a salesperson and they'll be selling from day one. It doesn't work that way. It takes kind of three to six months for a rep to be able to ramp, to be able to be generating at the expected quota that you hired them for. Um, and so I think a lot of people get caught up in that where it's like, okay, here's our goals. Here's what we've committed to the VCs. Let's go hire some salespeople and then don't realize they're actually six months behind their projections. Okay. Um, and let's get to targets and compensation in a second. Um, any tips for hiring? So whether it's job description or interview questions or interviewing process that can be really valuable. Yeah. Yeah. We, uh, so we don't have a rubric for interview questions. Um, if you want a job description, go to chat GBT, type in sales development rep job description, and it's about as good as it will get. You can then go tweak it for your business. Um, but it's pretty standard if you're doing B2B SaaS, SDR, like it's a pretty standard template. Um, same thing for AEs. Again, you're going to define, you know, which level. So you have SMB, AEs, you have commercial, essentially mid-market and then enterprise. Make sure you know which one you're hiring. Um, and so what Jason and Sam always talk about is when you go to hire those first salespeople, hire people that have done what you're trying to hire for. Like most people go and say, oh, you sold at Salesforce and we can get you. Great, we'll bring you in until you realize that those people haven't done any outbound for like 10 years of their career, right? And so you essentially want someone who's been a first 10 sales hire at a startup in a vertical similar to yours. That's kind of what they say. And we did the same thing. We were able to go get two really good reps from local companies here in Utah that sell similar products with similar deal sizes, with similar sales cycles. And so nothing was foreign for them. And it's like, all I had to do at that point then was give them the talk track and they were able to go from day one. Okay. And then how important was stage? Had those reps been at an early stage company before? Yeah, they were both essentially series A companies in okay, Utah. Okay. Right. Okay. And then, um, okay. And let's talk a little bit about benchmarks, like how many calls should they be making? What should be the con uh, conversion rate or something like that? What's either your rule of thumbs or where would you suggest founders go to find such benchmarks? Yeah. yeah I think it's a really good question around, again, what level of AE are you hiring? What SDR are you hiring? Uh, for me, SDRs are about a hundred calls a day, usually, and um, usually around 50 emails a day. LinkedIn messages, about 25 a day. Um, I've always gone for an omni-channel approach to outbound. Sales has changed. Cold calls don't work like they used to five years ago. Emails don't work like they used to. So we have all our reps, essentially SMS texting, really strong on LinkedIn. Again, kind of a part of that marketing play. Um, and then I have always said in an interview, ask them, what's your cadence today? And that will give you a really good kind of feel on how comfortable they are with outbound um i'll be transparent i hated outbound like i didn't make a cold call at qualtrics in four years it's not how i worked um but i was successful and i was lucky that i had managers that understood that but if you'd have hired me thinking i was going to go and make 100 cold calls it was never going to happen that's not how i operated so i think it's really important in the interview what's your current cadence what do you do from an outbound perspective? Does that align with what your expectations are? Um, and then I would say for an AE, it's like maybe 50 cold calls a day, 
25, just essentially just cut in half whatever an SDR is doing, knowing that they're going to be spending about half their day doing demos and discovery meetings. Okay, great. And, um, okay. Um, let's talk a little bit more about compensation. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I liked your idea of the ramping quota, pay them 20%, get them motivated, let them see the goals. How did you think about base versus incentive comp for reps? Yeah, uh, we actually use, luckily, again, I kind of know what the benchmarks are, at least here in Utah. Um, and that was, a, a you know, kind of a piece that we tested early on is, okay, do we want to go get a rep in California? You're going to pay 30 grand more for the same level of talent um and so we made a decision early on that we want them in the office we want them to be able to learn from us have that element of osmosis and so we were able to find what the benchmarks were for the other essentially big tech companies in utah our base is a little bit lower but the fact that we paid 20 percent commission um we were able to go get two really good aes um and so obviously i don't recommend that for everyone um but you know again we were trying to be scrappy we still wanted really good talent could we get them for a little bit less from an annual salary standpoint but incentivize them with that commission structure and and it's worked for us okay and then after the ramp period do you think about still a straight line percentage for commission or are you saying here's your quota and here's your target incentive comp therefore the um kind of commission rate falls out of it yeah so b2b SaaS salespeople, it's a pretty standard structure you have a base salary which is 50 percent of your overall number and then we call it ote so on target earnings you add another 50 percent, and that total number gives you the ote so for example you know if i'm 150k base my ot is 300 and that was 10 percent of a 1.5 number like it's that simple and structured okay. um, and, and that's pretty standard across b2b SaaS. okay and you mentioned you've mentioned jason lemkin from saster is mm -hmm. would you recommend the saster blog for anybody who's trying to get smarter on sales and benchmark is that it um yeah, my, my number one recommendation sam blonde um mm -hmm. He did, he's done a number of podcasts. Uh, he was the, I think he was the CRO at Brex. He did Zenefits with Jason back in the day, uh, really close with the Rippling people. He essentially goes on these podcasts and shares a lot of tips and tricks about hiring an initial sales team. I would say he's essentially the gold standard. So he right. did, uh, it was a 20 VC podcast with Sam Blonde and I can share okay. the link up. Okay, yeah, we'll make sure that we get that out. Okay, so now let's move to, um, the tech stack, because I think this is super actionable. So cast yourself back to day zero and you got a, maybe a spreadsheet or whatever, but mm -hmm. what should um, early companies be yeah. thinking about? In yeah, terms of I would say the tech stack is kind of combined with a few pieces. Yeah. So you need a CRM early days. Uh, we were fortunate enough through Village, we got a massive discount on HubSpot. We're still on that platform. Uh, I think Salesforce is overkill for early stage companies. Uh, I talk about it essentially like Apple versus Android. Like, are you comfortable with just an iPhone? All the apps are right where they should be. It's easy to use. That's HubSpot. If you want to get super complicated, go do Salesforce, right? All the bells and whistles. But I think day one, I would honestly suggest a HubSpot. I would then say you need what we call a revenue intelligence tool. So this will be your Apollo your gongs, your clary, outreaches, et cetera. And that is kind of the core of the outbound motion. So that's where you're sending your emails from. That's where you get your uh, database of customers you're going to potentially reach out to. Um, and then obviously the third piece we, we wanted to go in and bring in is essentially an additional lead magnet, like a Wombly or a qualified or an RB2B, where we understand who's come to our website. And I, it, it's kind of unconventional again, but like I really recommend that at the early stage when you're trying to figure out who your ICP is, because you yeah. can see who's hitting the website. So if it's a bunch of financial services people, but you're selling real estate, you got a problem, right? And so we use both of those tools. We use um, we use Wombly and RB2B. Uh, and so I think like from an initial stack, Apollo is my suggestion for early stage because you'll get a database, you'll get an outbound uh, dialer, you'll get an email sequence tool, um, and then you can go and get an outreach if you really need once you've got a larger team. Um, but yeah, HubSpot, Apollo, and then an RB2B or a Walmart, and Alicia, of course. Thank yes, you. exactly, exactly. Um, okay, and then let's just talk about top of funnel. How should somebody think about building that initial top of funnel? 
Yeah. Again, I think that, you know, that omni-channel approach where cold calls and emails worked for about a decade, right? That That's the primary way that we did sales. Now, I, I, I honestly think 50 to 60% of our outbounding efforts and the top of funnel generation comes from LinkedIn. Yeah. Probably more pertinent to us because that's where our buyers live. Um, but that, that's kind of the question you have to ask yourself is like, where do our buyers live? If they're at trade shows, like go be at the trade shows. Um, you're going to get much more success being at a trade show than you know making a thousand cold calls. Um, and so for us, it's, you know, I'd say it's a mix of the outbound efforts, um, the inbound from the marketing. And then we actually have been heavy on the events piece as well. Um, and that's the approach that we take. So we call it omni-channel, multiple threads, different ways. And then you're testing in the early days to essentially say like, where does our success come from? And that's going to be different for every organization. Um, you know, at old companies for me, it was email. That's just what worked. Uh, but I was pinging the CISOs and CTOs. They don't live on LinkedIn. So LinkedIn didn't make sense for me. Um, and so you really have to think about that. The other piece is you can jump into partnerships. Um, and so if you are selling to a very kind of complicated buyer, like a CTO or a CISO, they don't want to talk to salespeople. They want to talk to their partners who they know and trust who will deliver products to them. And so early days, you have to think about that as well. Can I get in front of my buyer, which is the, the, the channel that's working to get them into the top of funnel? Uh, and then I just say double down on whichever effort is working the best for you at the beginning. And um, talk to us about the channels. Do, are you incenting the channels? How do you work, make those work? Yeah, I think the hardest thing early days is those channel partners want to sell products that they know they can get a big paycheck on and they have to trust you. Um, so it's a muscle that takes a while to build up. Like I was at Lacework, we had $2 billion in funding and we still had partners that didn't want to sell our product. So you have to be able to go and compete with the others in your industry. And they may be already selling a competitor. You have to figure that out. Um, but I would say kind of start local and figure out that narrative in your home base first who are the best channel partners in Utah, in Austin, in, in California, and then figure out that motion with them early days. What did they expect? What percentage do they want to take off the top? Um, make those relationships. Like we were, we were going to, you know, these channel partners, kids, basketball games and things like that, where it's like, you have to build a relationship. But in the end, for the last five years of my career, I did 95% of my number from channel partners. So yeah, it just depends on what, and what that looks like. Yeah, it's interesting because some uh, startups report that they invest a lot in the channel relationships and they just never end up delivering and they wish sometimes, oh, it took, you know, I wasted eight months. So I guess it's, can you start seeing results and, you know, it, like anything else you're testing, is it worth spending time here versus the other options in your thing? Um, okay. And then are you using any lead scoring, enrichment, anything Um any of those additional data sources or is that all coming from Apollo or something like that? That's, that's all coming from Apollo for us. So we went out to market. We knew the CRO at Zoom Info. Uh, we got quoted $18,000 for Zoom Info, went to Apollo and it was five grand. And at the time they had two or three additional products that we wanted that we would have paid for separately. So I think Apollo is kind of swallowing up the market right now from a lead management standpoint. Um, and that's that's worked well for us. Again, I don't get any commission from talking about Apollo. It's just a product <laughs> we've used that we have found success with. Um, but, you know, there's a number of others, Seamless, .ai, uh, Zoom Info is kind of the leader yep. in this space. Okay. And then how about drip campaigns and things like that? Is your marketer working on your HubSpot implementation to do some of that CRM? Yeah, correct. That's where we use HubSpot. So for us, HubSpot is our CRM uh, and then essentially marketing CRM as well. Um, they they like living in HubSpot. And that's kind of what they're used to in the marketing world. You'll often see sales teams in Salesforce and then marketing in HubSpot. Because we went with HubSpot, we all live in the same place. Um, but yeah, correct. Anyone that comes into our website, we actually have Warmly AI that will tell us who's visited. You have an AI chat, and then it goes and pings Slack of who's visited, and they get dripped into an automated outbound email sequence. So if uh, any company visits the website, it automatically will send six emails to a persona that we've set, 
and say, hey, it looks like someone from your company was on the website. Here's what we do. You open and learning more. Uh, and we don't touch it. That's all automated. Um, and so that, that's been really good for us. And then we have marketing, see that sequence in HubSpot, and then starts its own campaign on top of that. Got it. And then how are... You, I love the fact that you said your marketing team is has some incentive compensation. Um, where do you get the benchmarks for what is good conversion? Where should they spend their time? Or you know, any any ideas on that? Yeah, I, I honestly, LinkedIn is a goldmine for these kind of things. Like you can just okay. go and search like marketing benchmarks. Um, right. from a compensation benchmark, we use Carter, so you can kind of see what average pay sales are. Um, and then obviously, yeah, just a simple Google search to just get early benchmarks. And again, make sure you're looking at startup benchmarks, not Qualtrics benchmarks can be very different. Okay. And let's talk about demos. What makes a great customer call and follow up and that kind of thing? Yeah, I would say you kind of have to think about it. Like we always talk about command of the message, right? Like this is my call. I own the narrative. I set the agenda. Um, I spend a lot of time in the discovery phase. So that should be your first call, maybe 30 minutes, maybe an hour. Uh, I've had sales where I will do three or four discovery calls before I ever show them the platform. Um, that's intentional. Um, you know, you don't want to show the product and go through and show every feature and functionality. They don't really care. It's can you solve my pain? Um, and if you can solve the pain, they don't really care what it looks like. So that discovery phase is going through and, and I use the MedPick system. Um, you know, you could use Band, which is budget, authority, need, timeline. Really qualify people early on. Um, it's easy to book a demo, right? You could send them a gift card to take a demo, et cetera. But like, do you want to spend your time demoing to the wrong person, someone who doesn't have authority, someone who isn't looking to buy a tool right now, the timelines don't line up. And so I say, always spend a lot of time in that discovery phase, unless you're selling a credit card transactional type sale where you don't need to. Um, but anything of any sort of enterprise level, you really have to understand the need early on. Um, and so when I actually get to the demo, I do really quick demos. Um, I probably only spend 15 to 20 minutes talking about the product itself. Um, and I want to be able to say, hey, these are the needs that you told me about. These are the pains we're trying to solve. And look, this is how our product solves it. Awesome. Yeah, I think that's really interesting. Okay. And I'm, we're going to wrap up in a few minutes. So if anyone has questions, please put them in the chat. Um, uh, and how do you think about onboarding? What's been your lessons about onboarding? customers yeah i think this is one of the hardest pieces uh, i've never been a cs manager i've never done that piece um you know i think you learn early on that every onboarding interaction is different um we were able to get ours down to about two hours um and this was something we decided on very early we're not selling octa and lace work it was three to six month implementations now if that's your case like be upfront and be transparent, right? It's better to say it's going to take three months to onboard than you know to say it's going to take two hours and it takes three months. Um, for us, we've we've kind of slimmed the entire process down where we built the product to have as much as possible out of the box. If you have it out of the box, they can just onboard, touch the product, be in it. Um, so we have Tom, who actually is our head of product. Uh, we asked him to wear an additional hat and essentially be a head of CS. So both he and I are on every single onboarding call. It's usually 30 minutes. We ask, we have an outline template that we use of this is what we expect. We put a timeline on it. We call it a mutual action plan. This is the deliverable. This is when you say you're going to do it and you hold them accountable to that. They actually sign off on that um, because most of the time you're ready to go and they think they're ready to go, but they're not. Um, and so you don't want to be that person that's sending three or four emails to follow up. It's like, hey, one email, this is the expected timeline. Do you have this for us, et cetera? Um, we want to make sure very early on that you have the right person in the room. Uh, I can't emphasize this enough. If you're doing an implementation with Salesforce, you need the Salesforce admin available and on that call. Otherwise, you'll waste 30 minutes talking to someone who can't do anything with Salesforce and have to go and schedule another call. And so set the expectations early, have the right people in the room, and try and make that process as streamlined and easy for the customer as possible. Okay, great. And Christina highlighted a good question about exclusivity. How do you handle requests for the exclusivity? Is that for like certain product build-outs or? 
Oh, uh, no, for a customer that says, hey, I want exclusivity um, and I'm a big customer, how do you answer that question? Yeah, um, fortunately for us, you know, we, we haven't run into that yet. Uh, I had it at Call Tricks and whatnot. I think it's really easy at the early stages to say, like, we don't have the bandwidth, right? And to be comfortable with that. Um, oftentimes, you know, we will prioritize certain customers and say, okay, this one is a 30K deal. Let's onboard them first. Uh, and this is kind of opening the kimono a little bit, but it was a tactic. We used to use at Qualtrics all the time where you would say, okay, you want priority, you want exclusivity. Uh, can you sign by a certain date? Um, I was doing a deal with a really large telco down in Miami, and we actually had an expected deadline for the signatures on the, on the dock. They said, hey, we're going to have to push it. And I use that as a tactic to say, well, then you're going to get pushed down the queue for onboarding. And now your timeline that you gave me, you're not going to be able to hit. And so the CTO called in 15 people on a Saturday and we hashed everything out. So I think be careful with how you use it. Um, and again, like I, I just think it comes down more to the resources. Like, is it worth it for your team to go and take that on, push five other customers down the way? to go and do that one, that's a decision you have to make. Got it. Okay. Um, and then uh, any tips for creating urgency with customers? Yeah, yeah. So uh, we always talk about having a compelling event. Uh, oftentimes this is dictated by the customer. Oftentimes you're gonna have to fabricate one, right? So like I just talked about, if you don't sign by X date, you're getting pushed three months down the onboarding queue. Is that real? Maybe, right? But they, they, don't, they don't know that. And, and that could be the case. And so you can use that as a compelling event. Like you can sign by here and I promise you, you're on board on Monday. Um, you can use end of quarters, end of months as compelling events to get things done. Um, but again, in sales, it's always like you have the quarterly goals, they don't. But they might have a certain date that they need to get a project done by. Um, and so I think in that discovery phase is like when you do BANT and you understand timeline, really early on if you get that that's essentially your secret weapon to speed up that entire process okay if you want to launch on may 1st these are the five things we need to have in place and reverse engineer it from may 1st and that creates that timeline and the urgency um i mean i hate it but there's also the option for discounts um yeah yeah every salesperson does it if you're comfortable with your pricing you know kind of where you have the wiggle room and it's worth it you can always use those but i say it's a last resort um, yes, exactly. Well, and then the other set, what are the other appeals to ego? We've heard like things like, um, oh, which is if you sign by this date, we'll do a joint press release or or we'll feature you in our newsletter or we'll put your CEO on our podcast or, you know, like uh, sometimes um, that can help. Um, my favorite old tip was to reach out to the boss of the person and, and commend them on how innovative they were. And it always used to seem to work. To get it. Yeah. Um, okay. So uh, last question I think is how do you know when an AE can't learn it or they just need more training? How do you know? Is a tough balance, right? So I think that always comes down to at onboarding, set the metrics, right? So you have ramping expectations. If they can't hit those, be very comfortable of just saying like, you didn't do the three month expectation. We have to let you go. There's a really big tech company in Utah. They're extremely transparent about that. You get fired if you don't hit those onboarding metrics. Now, I think you can kind of see behind the curtain sometimes and say, okay, they got a little bit unlucky. There's a lot of talent here, it's worthwhile. But if that's the case and they didn't hit those first three month metrics, give them a little bit of a grace period and set another three months of metrics and hold them accountable. And if they haven't done it again, now you've got a bigger problem on your hands. Um, but, you know, I think everyone has to be comfortable with firing fast um, because salespeople, you know, we can learn a lot of things, but inherently most of it is internal. Like, do they have the drive? Do they have the grit? Do they really want it as much as you do? Because if they do, they will figure out a way to hit those metrics. But if they miss it twice, like just rip the Band-Aid off. They're not, they're not going to change. Love it. Well, I don't want to end on that note because that seems very, <laughs> it's very, it's really real. Um, but no, no, that is, um, yeah, that's amazing. And then I think that idea that because you're tracking it, you know, where are they getting stuck? Are they getting the meetings? Okay. They didn't get the meeting. Are they not? Whatever. And then there's some, as your platform, let's coaching. So, and um, tell us how can um, folks on the call learn more about Alessio 
tell us anything they should know. Yeah, alicia.ai is our website. Aaron at alicia.ai is my email. Uh, if you email me, I'll respond. And then if not, LinkedIn message to me as well. Happy to chat. Wonderful. Well, Aaron, thank you so much for your time and your expertise. And uh, it's worth its weight in gold. Thank you so much. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate Thanks, it. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Way to go. So appreciated. Of course. Thank you, Anne. Appreciate <laughs> it. See you soon. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.